and wrapping up chapter 8 here we're going to discuss intelligence. Intelligence is the ability to use knowledge to reason, make decisions, make sense of events, solve problems, understand complex ideas, learn quickly, and adapt to environmental challenges. Psychologists consider two questions when measuring intelligence. How do knowledge and its application in everyday life translate into intelligence? And how much is intelligence determined by genes or by the environment? And as you may know, intelligence is measured with standardized tests. The psychometric approach to measuring intelligence focuses on how people perform on standardized tests. Some psychometric tests focus on achievement, while other tests focus on aptitude. Scientists named Binet pr pr propose that intelligence is best understood as a collection of high-level mental processes. Psychometric tests of general intelligence include the Stanford-Binet test, which measures intelligence using the Intelligent Quotient, or IQ, score. In 1939, the psychologist David Wexler developed an intelligence test for adults. Wexler was dissatisfied with various features of the Stanford-Binet scale, including its reliance on verbal information and its assessment of intelligence by a single score. The Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale has two parts, verbal and performance. The performance part of IQ test includes nonverbal tasks. Here are some examples similar to items used in the WAIS-3. In a picture arrangement, these pictures tell a story. Put them in the right order to tell the story. Another section is object assembly. If these pieces are put together correctly, they make something. Put them together as fast as you can. And the third example is the digit symbol substitution. Using the code provided, fill in the missing information in the test picture. All right, IQ involves mental age and the intelligent quotient. Mental age is an assessment of the child's intellectual standing compared with that of same age peers. This is determined by comparing the child's test scores with the average test scores for children of each chronological age introduced by Binet. The intelligent quotient is an index of intelligence computed by dividing the child's estimated mental age by the child's chronological age, then multiplying this number by 100. This was developed by Wilhelm Stern. IQ in the adult range is measured in comparison with the average adult and not with adults of different ages. Across large groups of people, the distribution of IQ scores forms a bell curve, or normal distribution. Most people are close to the average. IQ is a score on a normed test of intelligence, that is, one person's score is relative to the scores of the large number of people who already took the test. As is discussed in Chapter 2, the statistical concept of standard deviation indicates how far people are from the average. The standard deviation for most IQ tests is 15. The average, or mean, is 100. As shown in this bell-shaped curve, Approximately 68% of people fall within one standard deviation of the mean. They score an 85 to 115. Just over 95% of children fall within two standard deviations. They score from 70 to 130. Now we'll discuss the validity of this testing. The overall evidence indicates that IQ is a fairly good predictor of life outcomes, for example, doing well at school. Data suggests modest correlations between IQ and work performance, IQ and income, and IQ and jobs requiring complex skills. 
IQ scores typically predict only about 25% of the variation in performance at either school or work. IQ may be very important, but it is only one of the factors that contributes to success in the classroom, the workplace, and life generally. Additional factors include background, self-control, motivation, and willingness to work. People from privileged backgrounds tend to have higher IQs. I'll expand on that. Why people from privileged backgrounds have higher IQs. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. People from privileged backgrounds usually have more access to better education. They also tend to have more toys thrown at them through their entire life. Some of those are developmental toys that help them develop. They travel. They're exposed to more things. It's not some sort of innate thing. It's just the money at work. All right, general intelligence involves multiple components. An early line of research examined the correlations among intelligence tests and items using factor analysis. In this statistical technique, items similar to one another are clustered, and the clusters are called factors. A psychologist named Charles Spearman found that the most intelligence test items tended to cluster as one factor. Spearman viewed general intelligence, or G, as a factor that contributes to performance on any intellectual task. General intelligence is the idea that one general factor underlies intelligence. As depicted in this cluster of overlapping ovals and circle, Spearman viewed G as the general factor in intelligence. This underlying factor influences an individual specific abilities related to intelligence. Intelligence can be separated into two different kinds. This was done by a scientist named Cattell in 1971. This person proposed that G consists of two types of intelligence, fluid and crystallized. Fluid intelligence is intelligence that reflects the ability to process information, understand relationships, and think logically, particularly in novel or complex circumstances. Novel in this case means new. Crystallized intelligence, however, is intelligence that reflects both the knowledge acquired through experience and the ability to use that knowledge. Fluid intelligence is new and adaptable. Crystallized intelligence is intelligence that is already gained and set in stone. Distinguishing between fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence is somewhat analogous to distinguishing between working memory more like fluid intelligence, and long-term memory, more like crystallized intelligence. Crystallized intelligence grows steadily throughout the adult years, while fluid intelligence declines steadily. There are multiple intelligences. This is the idea that there are different types of intelligence that are in independent of one another. Scientists named Gardner proposed that people can be intelligent in any number of ways, such as being musically or athletically talented. Another scientist, Sternberg, theorized that there are three types of intelligence. Analytical, creative, and practical. Analytical intelligence, as he defined it, is similar to that measured by psychometric tests. This is being good at problem solving and other academic challenges. Creative intelligence is involving the ability to gain insight to solve novel problems, to think in new and interesting ways. And lastly, practical intelligence is dealing with everyday tasks, such as knowing whether a parking space is large enough for your vehicle. Another form of intelligence is referred to as emotional intelligence. This is a form of social intelligence that emphasizes the abilities to manage, 
recognize, and understand emotions and use emotions to guide appropriate thought and action. This happens in terms of regulating our moods, resisting impulses and temptations, and controlling our behaviors, which are all important components of emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is, cor is correlated with the quality of social relationships. Again, that might not cause causation, but you can see why they're correlated. Some critics have questioned whether emotional intelligence really is a type of intelligence or whether it stretches the definition of intelligence too far. Intelligence is related to cognitive performance. Scientists named Galton believed that intelligence was related to the speed of neural responses and to the sensitivity of the sensory perceptual systems, and he speculated that intelligent people have larger, more efficient brains. Other sci psychologists believe intelligence is supported by low-level cognitive functions such as mental processing, working memory, and attention. People who score higher on intelligence tests respond more quickly and consistently on reaction time tests. A test of simple reaction time might require a person to press a computer key as quickly as possible whenever a stimulus appears on the screen. Scores on intelligence tests are related strongly to this, to this choice reaction time. Further support for the relationship between general intelligence and speed of mental processing comes from inspection time tests. If a stimulus is presented and then covered up, how much viewing time does a particular person need to answer a question about the stimulus? Here's an example of inspection time task. The task is to determine whether side A or side B of the stimulus is longer. Stimulus is presented and then quickly followed by a mask. Judging the lengths is easy when you have enough time to view the stimulus, but it becomes difficult when the mask decreases viewing time severely. By measuring the electrical activity of, the, of brains in response to the presentation of stimuli, researchers have found that highly intelligent people's brains work faster than less intelligent people's brains. The relationship between general intelligence and mental speed appears to be correlated with the greater longevity of people with high IQs. The relationship between reaction time and longevity was somewhat stronger than the relationship between scores on standardized intelligence tests and longevity. All right, now we're going to discuss working memory. If you'll recall, we discussed this a chapter or two ago. General intelligence scores are closely related to working memory but are not identical. Studies differentiate between simple tests of memory span and memory tests that require some form of secondary processing. Memory tests that have dual components show a strong relationship between working memory and general intelligence. The link between working memory and general intelligence may be attention or the ability to pay attention. Here's an example of a memory span task. For a simple word span task, a, a participant listens to a short list of words and then repeats the words in order. For a more difficult secondary processing task, a participant has to solve simple mathematical operations at the same time the words are presented. Once again, the person has to repeat the words in the order they were presented. Because they're having to work math at the same time as showing processing ability. All right, now we're going to discuss brain structure and function. Many studies have documented the relationship between head circumference, which researchers use to estimate brain size, and scores on S intelligence tests. Head circumference also predicts school performance, although the correlation is quite small. 
Studies using brain imaging have found a small but significant correlation between the size of selected brain structures and scores on intelligence tests. These findings are correlations, however, so it cannot be inferred that brain size necessarily causes differences in intelligence. There could be other factors at play. Different kinds of intelligence seem to be related to the sizes of certain brain regions. These regions include areas associated with working memory, planning, reasoning, and problem solving. Studies have found that the volume of neuronal cell bodies, or gray matter, in the frontal lobes and in other brain regions support attentional controls related to fluid general intelligence. Studies have found no relationship, however, between the volume of frontal gray matter and crystallized intelligence. These findings are consistent with, consistent with evidence that injury to frontal lobes causes impairments in fluid intelligence, but not in crystallized intelligence. All right, now we're going to talk about a different kind of intelligence, savants. Savants have minimal intellectual ca capacities in most domains, but at a very early age, each savant shows an exceptional ability in some intelligent process. A savant's exceptional ability may be related to math, music, or to art. The combination of prodigious memory and the inabil inability to learn basic tasks is a great mystery. This rare combination adds a dimension to our understanding of intelligence. Here's an example of a fellow named Stephen Wiltshire. Despite having autism spectrum disorder, Stephen Wiltshire has published a book of his remarkable, remarkably accurate and expressive memory-based drawings by the time he was a young teenager. Here in October 2010, he holds his drawing of an architectural site in London, England. Wiltshire, Wiltshire observed the site briefly, then completed the picture largely from memory. Genes and environment can both in influence intelligence. Even if intelligence has a genetic component, the way intelligence becomes expressed is affected by various situational circumstances. For example, the capacity for having a large vocabulary is considered considerably heritable, but each word in a person's vocabulary is learned in an environment. Instead of seeking to demonstrate whether nature or nurture is the most important factor, psychologists try to identify how each of these crucial factors contributes to intelligence. Numerous behavioral genetic studies have made clear that genes help determine intelligence, but the extent to which genes do so is difficult to determine. Behavioral geneticists study the genetic basis of behaviors and traits such as intelligence. They use twin and adoption studies to estimate the extent to which particular traits are heritable. Even when raised apart, twins who have inherited an, an advantage might receive some social multiplier, an environmental factor or an entire environment that increases what might have started as a small advantage. Suppose twins have inherited a higher than average verbal ability. Adults who notice this ability might read to them more often and give them more books. Many f environmental factors influence human intelligence. There are prenatal factors. This could be parents' nutrition and intake of substances, including toxins, drugs and alcohol. There are also postnatal factors, which include family, social class, education, nutrition, cultural beliefs about the value of education, and the person's intake of substances, including toxins. There's also a relationship between birth weight and intelligence later in life. Here is a graphic to show that birth weight and intelligence among children of normal birth weight mean IQ scores increase with weight.
All right, environmental factors include socioeconomic status, or SES. That's an example of growing up in a wealthy family significantly increases IQ by 12 to 18 points. Remember what I said, it's just because they have more experiences and exposure to things, more toys, and they're definitely more likely to have a computer at an early age and all kinds of stuff like that. Research from numerous laboratories have shown that enriched environments enhance learning and memory. The implication is that environmental influences how genes involved in brain development are expressed. Schooling encourages the development of children's brains and cognitive capacities and therefore fosters intelligence. The dramatic rise of IQ scores during the last century have been called the Flynn effect. Since genes cannot have changed much during this period, the increases must be due to environmental factors or epigenetic effects. When looking at group differences in IQ, it is important to remember the environmental factors. If one group has a higher SES or socioeconomic status, then that group might perform better. And that concludes part four of chapter eight.